and welcome to the Feet of Jesus where we are going through the entire Bible one book at a time and we are in the book of Acts and in fact we are in Acts 14 and we're using this book as always I will put a link to it in the description so that you can get the workbook and join us in its completion but before we get into the Bible verses we are going to just talk a tiny bit about Acts 14 in general and so remember in Acts 13 it the, the whole from Acts 13 through the end of Acts it's all about Paul and his minis, uh, missionary journeys and Acts 14 is his first missionary journey so you're going from location to location there's three main things that we're looking at in Acts 14. The first thing we're looking at is his journey and his experiences in Iconium. And then we look at Lystra. And then after that, we look at his first kind of, what, we, what I'm going to call his first missionary conference. So in Iconium, the thing that I found that was interesting is it says that in verse 1, so this is right before our first uh, verse that we're going to study, it says, Now it happened in Iconium that they went together, they, meaning Barnabas and Paul, they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude both of the Jews and of the Greeks believed. So that's one of the first things that's really interesting to talk about. So if they can so speak that a lot believed, I think the opposite has to be true. We can speak so that no one believes. <laughs> we can speak so that our words don't make a difference. And you know when that is? That's when God's not involved in our conversation. So I think it's good to keep God involved in our speech and in what we're doing. Now, verse two is our very first study verse. So we are gonna look at that. So it's Acts 14, two. So the study verse says, but the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. And so this is again in Iconium and the biggest problem in this part of their journey was narrow-minded religious people. And I'm going to tell you that I think that's the biggest problem with most issues that we have sometimes even in just the Christian faith today is narrow-minded religious people. Remember, we're not trying to be religious. We're only trying to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, a true, meaningful, deep, faithful relationship with Jesus Christ. The second we become religious is when we are holding way too hard and fast to the rules and to the uh, things that we do every Sunday at church or the, the rules and the associations that go with church. It's not the relationship. It's not the reason we go to church. One thing that I think has really helped with this whole pandemic is it's helped us see that the church isn't a building. I think a lot of people are feeling more and more close to Jesus and they haven't been in the building for months. And so the church is the people. And so let's just keep working on that. Now, my observation in Acts 14 2 was, I just really hit on the word disbelief. So it says, again, the verse says, but the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and then embittered, embittered them against the brethren. So disbelieved. You know what that means? It means that you are either a believer or a disbeliever. It means there's nothing in the middle. So are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Are you a believer in what the Bible says? Are you a believer in what Paul was trying to accomplish here in Iconium? 
If you are, then you are a believer. If you don't believe that, you are a disbeliever. And so, you know, one thing we need to keep in mind is don't let disbelievers affect your faith. Talk to God. If you're having a, con a, a problem with your church, with the body, with an issue, talk to God about it. Get involved with God about it. I think that's really, really important. And so let's go to the next verse. By the way, isn't this pretty where I am today? I just think it's gorgeous. And uh, I'll let you all try to decide where I am. It'll be a big guess. But anyway, Acts 14, 17 is our next verse. And it's actually kind of interesting. If you didn't actually read the passage, so the passage is eight, verses 8 through 20. If you haven't read those verses, I would go back and read them because you won't get the context of these verses if you don't go through them. So let me read the verses and then I'm going to help give you the context. So the verses. Nevertheless, so this is uh, Acts 14, 17. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witnesses in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So this is in Lystra. And let me tell you a little bit about Lystra. There was a writer and his name was Ovid from ancient times and he wrote a, a a poem a story about Lystra and in that story Zeus and Hermes came down to the city of Lystra and they were looking for people to treat them well well no one treated them well all over the place and except for one older couple and so Zeus and Hermes flooded the whole area, flooded the city, and saved that one couple, and created this whole castle for them, and treated them well for the rest of their days. So that's what we're, that is the story that's behind this. So the people in Lystra think that Barnabas and Paul, because they have produced a miracle, and so all of a sudden the people of Lystra think that they are Zeus and Hermes coming back again and so this time they are not going to get stuck they are not going to be flooded they are going to treat barnabas and paul aka zeus and hermes so well that there's no way that there could be a problem and so um that's why they're showering them with praise and and offerings and stuff they're not going to get lost well paul and barnabas are trying to say wait a minute we are not Zeus and Hermes and in fact we are nothing we are men but there is a God and that God that this is where we come up with our verse nevertheless he did not leave himself without witnesses in that he our God did good gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness after that then they really pour on all of the love to Paul and Barnabas and they're like ugh. Okay, so in context, what can we pull from that? In context, Paul and Barnabas are being mistaken for Zeus and Hermes, right? And in this, this text, we need to keep in mind that every good and perfect gift comes from above. It does not come from Zeus and Hermes. It does not come from your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your mother or father. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, and that's James 1.17. So, don't let others get the, the honor of how you experienced a good thing. Give that honor to God. But we are going to take that one step further in our last verse, okay? Because this last verse helped me see something for myself that was really important and I want you to see it too. So let's, um, this is Acts 14, 22. It says, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So 
this is the first missionary conference. So Paul has really enjoyed his time on his first missionary journey. He's done so well with it and there's been so many people that have come to Christ through it and he is thrilled. He's super excited and he comes back to the disciples and he really wants to tell them all about it. And so he's sitting there telling them. He's excited and this is what he's saying. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So exhorting, that's one of the spiritual gifts that some of us have. And I think we can um, get confused on what, what exhorting means, okay? <laughs> exhorting has two sides of it. First of all, it's encouragement, but the other is teaching. And so when I first did my, uh, did one of those very long, very exhaustive, uh, spiritual gift surveys, I found that exhort exhortation was one of my spiritual gifts. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. I'm great at encouraging. Awesome. That really is me. And then the person that was helping me with my gift, a survey, helping me interpret it said, yes, it is that. But there's another side. It's the side of teaching and it's the side of being able to tell someone they're doing it wrong when they're doing it wrong and I went ooh I'm not so good at that I'm good at doing that with my kids <laughs> <laughs> and one of my kids is holding the phone right now so <laughs> she's laughing a little bit but I'm not good at doing that at least at the time I wasn't good at doing that with people and God and his glory have helped me learn how to tell people when they're not doing it right but that is the one, one thing I wanted to explain to you. And then the other thing is Paul's excitement in his journey. And the thing that this has helped me understand, plus some other things I've learned recently on some of my missionary journeys that I took in, in um, February and March, were that it's okay to be excited about what God's doing through you. And I think, you know, I've, talked to people in the past and I've complimented them on um, something they did ministry related and I think we feel awkward accepting that but I don't think we have to feel awkward in accepting that God knows your heart if in your heart you are excited not because you've done something but because you know that you had almost nothing to do with it. It was God. It was every good and perfect gift comes from God above. That's what we looked at in the last verse. If you accept that praise as a vehicle to give God honor, you're good. You can be excited about what God's doing through you. So you know what? That's what I'd like to talk about this today. I would love you for to go out and selflessly do something for God. And if you get praise for it, be excited. And it's okay to say, thank you. It's so exciting to see what God's doing. That's an answer I give a lot. I, I tell them I, I accept it because people like you to accept their honoring of you. So I accept it, but then I give it on. And so that's a good way to do it. Accept it give it on. So I would love to hear about what you are excited about, what you have done this week. So, first of all, some business. Uh, watch the videos. Tell your friends to watch the videos. This is all good and we're just getting through the Bible and I've started giving you a little bit more background in these. So I'm spending more time researching these verses and researching the chapters and where we are. So soak that in, take it in and enjoy it and give it on, pass this on so that we can all um, learn more from it. So like, subscribe, comment, tell me what you did this week. Tell me how you answer people when they were excited about what you're doing, because that's okay. And then, what are we gonna put at Jesus' feet this week? You know, let's put the awkwardness 
that sometimes we feel when someone gives us praise and we don't know what to do with it. Let's put disbelief at Jesus' feet. Because you know what? Jesus is the only one that can handle that disbelief. We can't handle the disbelief in our friends and our family, but Jesus can. So let's hand, hand that to him and put it at his feet. And as I say every week, friends, God's got this because he truly surely does. And I love you, friends. Bye-bye.